We're recording. Thank you. Good evening. It's June 5th, 2023. This is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law has been extended. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. You are also welcome to attend the meeting in person in the town room. This meeting is accessible in real time via Zoom by phone and as a live broadcast on the Amherst Media Channel 9 and through their live streaming. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the June 5th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. I'll call upon each councilor by name. Please let me know if you can hear us and we can hear you and then make sure you mute your mic again. Shalini Bell Milne has informed me that she will be absent today. Pat DeAngelis is absent today. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Anika Lopes is absent today. Michelle Miller is absent today. Dorothy Pam. Here. Uh, Pam Rooney. Here. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Topp. Present. And has Alicia joined us? Um, I don't see Alicia yet, but I know people will keep an eye out for her. Okay. So we have eight counselors uh, present tonight. Very unusual. Um, there is no chat room um, for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena or me know. Uh, and if you want to make a comment, use the raise hand button. Uh, if technical difficulties arise, we will try to determine at the time what to do about that. At present, there is no change in the order of the agenda. Um, very quickly, we're going to go to announcements. Uh, and you can see the committees continue to meet although perhaps not as often. For example, Finance Committee is done with one of their major responsibilities, uh, which is reviewing the budget. Uh, the next page, please. I just wanna mention a couple of items coming up. We have a very grand celebration for Race Amity Day on, July, on June 11th, uh, starting at 10 a.m. at Mill River. And we will do the proclamation reading uh, after the noon lunch. And then there are various items associated with the Juneteenth celebration, and that is sun Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, June 17th, 18th, and 19th. Mandy Jo? Um, yeah, I just wanted to update the CRC meeting times and dates and let people know what they're for. There's two special meetings, one of which is not on this calendar yet. June 12th at 4.30 will be interviews for the planning board recommendation appointments. And June 15th at 11.30 a.m. is interviews for the ZBA appointment recommendations. Okay. We'll make sure those are all, all on the next calendar. And will they be virtual? They are um, Zoom virtual only, um, although there might be some counselors on that Monday meeting in the town room for it, but there will not be um, attendance in person okay. of members of the public. Okay. There is a council meeting on the night of the 12th at uh, noon. Um, okay, uh, we're moving on to the continuation of a hearing. Uh, and I believe the gentleman is here from Eversource. And so why don't you come forward? And um, Guilford, you are in the room on Zoom, okay? So this is, we did not close this hearing. So we're going to pick up where we left off. And where we left off was that you were going to be talking to the residents uh, that was concerned about the poll. And I believe you're bringing us an updated proposal. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we met with the 
President Gregory call and we worked out a new plan. So we've actually eliminated the pole that was gonna be directly across from his driveway. And there's a single pole that's gonna be a bit um, further up than it originally was, but so it's 33 feet southerly of the existing pole at the top there in line with the existing pole line. So it's gonna be a single new 45 foot class one pole along Dickinson Street. So we went from two to one. Okay. And Gregory was okay with this proposal. Okay. Uh, Guilford, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no. No. Uh, Dorothy, I'm going to go to counselor comments and then I'll see if there's any residents who want to comment. So Alicia is here. So <clears throat> I want to make sure Alicia can hear. Ah, I didn't see her. Thank you. Alicia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mandy Jo. So, Councilor, questions or comments, Dorothy? Uh, well, I drove down Dickinson Street today and I counted nine poles, uh, which I thought was an excessive amount. And half of the poles had a, a big tall pole and then one of those short stubby poles. And then they had a, um, a like a metal container for other wires. And it, the wires were big and droopy. Um, it was really not a good looking site. Um, this is not a place you're talking about putting it underground, but I imagine you were just talking about adding another pole, but it was, a, it did not look good. It looked way too many poles and, and with droopy, droopy uh, black wires. And it, it just it seemed like if this is what we have to do, I understand we have new demands on power um, and, and, and people want to have, receive that power to their houses. So I understand what the problem is, but I'm just hoping there's a better solution than what I saw today when I drove down the street. Would you like to speak to that? Sure, uh, I'll try to answer the best I can. So the double poles, um, I know Matt, last meeting that was brought up in operations does um, go about uh, removing those poles. So there's a process in place where Everest or the pole would get set, Eversource would do, typically the electric company goes in first, we'll do our line work, we'll cut the top of the pole, that's why there looks like there's a, a smaller, shorter pole. And then at that point, it's the other utilities that would come in. I'm not sure if it's Comcast, Charter, you know, Verizon. So they would come in and do their transfers. And then the next uh, utility would, would come into play. And then at that point, we would get notified through a system that we all share in common. And that would prompt us to then physically remove that bare pole. Um, I can certainly relay these correspondence to the operations and we can review the the droopy the droopy wires i'm not sure if that's electric or communications um but we can certainly take a look out there um and just to bring us uh, take a few steps back and refresh this so the purpose of this poll is there's going to be a, a new manhole at the at the intersection of college street um, it's not indicated on this map um because it's it was a separate petition but if you can see the the storm drains on the the two storm drains on the left-hand side, those rectangular boxes at the intersection, it's gonna be a manhole approximately at that location. And we're gonna be routing conduit from that manhole up Dickinson Street. And we're gonna be connecting to that pole that's going to be set. Um, so the purpose is to the, the new cables that we're bringing into the area, it's to uh, reconnect to the, the pole on Dickinson Street. So, I, um, okay. Guilford, you had another comment, and then I'm going to go to Mandy Jo. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that um, when you have a dual pole situation, and <clears throat> Eversource brought this up, it's mostly the other utilities we're waiting for. Um, Verizon has become very uh, slow to respond because they're phasing out their landline services and going um, mostly cellular, but they do have landlines around, but they are very slow to get them off old poles and move them to the new poles. So it's not really, not everything with a double pole has to do with Eversource. It does have to do with uh, Verizon, Comcast, five colleges, and there's a new a new company in town that's on the poles as well. So just so you know, it's a group of people. Okay, Mandy Joe, you have a question? Um, yeah, I just want to make sure I understand this. The last last time we were here, you were planning on moving pole 34 slash two and now and then adding the new one that 
I don't know what number it's got, number 140 or something. Um, but now 34 slash two is not being moved and we're just adding a poll. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And did you have any other comment? Okay. Are there any other counselor questions at this time before I go to the audience? This is a time for public comment about this particular issue. If you are here for that purpose and you are in the room, please make sure that you've signed up with Athena. Okay. Uh, and if you are in the audience and you would like to make public comment with regard to this particular issue only, please raise your hand. Okay, so we're going to go back. Are there any additional questions from the council? Seeing none, I'm then going to move to close the public hearing and to, um, to close the public hearing. Second. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question about that? We will vote this on the consent agenda unless someone indicates they would like it taken off. I'm going to start with um, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes is absent. Michelle Miller is absent. Dorothy Pam. And yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. It's unanimous with nine counselors present and four counselors absent. No caller. Sorry, that's not supposed to happen. Um, okay, um, the next item on our agenda is um, public comment. If you are here to make general public comment, please make sure you've registered with Athena over here. And if you are in the on Zoom and you would like to make general public comment, please raise your hand at this time. We do have one other public comment time. It is specifically in relationship to water and sewer rates, and it's later in the agenda. <clears throat> so I think, uh, are you going to make public comment together or separately? Together. Well, separate. Okay. Sorry. Separate. Okay. <laughs> same, same, same issue, but different right. comments. Okay. Please introduce yourself and tell My us where you Mary live. My name is Mary Ann Zomek, and I am the executive director of Cushman Scott Children's Center on Henry Street in Amherst. And I'm here to ask the town council, or just to tell the town council that for over 30 years, uh, the residents and Cushman Scott have been working trying to work with the town to get some sort of mitigation for speed. Um, the posted speed is 25, even though we have a school zone sign, which really the speed should be 20 miles an hour and it's posted as 25. We've had the police do a speed uh, detail. And even with the police, their speeds have exceeded 35, 45 miles an hour past the school. We have a parking lot across from the school and my staff and sometimes families have to cross that street to get to the building. And with the traffic, especially at pickup and drop off times, um, it gets a little dicey. And we are really worried that someday there will be a tragedy unless there are some mitigating factors put into. It. We would, we'd like to propose a three-way stop sign at uh, the end of Pine Street and Henry Street. We'd also love to have speed bumps in front of our school. Um, there's many things that we have suggested and they've gone un, 
unheeded and I'm just, I don't want to see a tragedy happen and I want people to feel safe. And it's scary to see what we see, so many near misses. And I'm just ask, here to ask the town to please do something. We've waited long enough. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. State your name, where you live. My name is Christopher Killian. I live at 460 Market Hill Road in Amherst. I got to you. Um, Kathy had come by my house at one point. We talked and uh, I'm also a parent of Cushman Scott children and have been for eight, almost nine years now. My youngest is about to graduate. Um, and in those nine, eight, nine years, I have witnessed, I should say it's full disclosure, I do work at Cushman Scott now part-time taking care of the facility. Um, but regardless of that, as a parent, um, and I'm, I'm not being dramatic, I have witnessed some real tragedies just avoided. And um, it, <laughs> if you could be there and you could experience it, you wouldn't want to. It, it really takes your breath away sometimes. Um, I refuse to see a child killed. It really boils down to that for me. Um, just, the, just last week, I was picking up my kid and we, I was backing out of the parking lot and I saw a pickup truck coming from the Market Hill Road end at a high rate of speed. This was just another example. And um, as they approached, I was trying to back out and then get it in gear and get out and into my lane. He hits the brakes because he decides it's finally time to stop or to slow down because there was no place for them to go or him to go. Um, I will respect the, the committee and not say exactly what he said to me as he drove by, but it starts with the letter F very loudly. And so it told me to do it to myself in front of my kids. And then he hit the gas and sped up and continued to speed down Henry Street. That's just one example of what happens on a daily basis. Um, I think some of you have read a letter that I sent. Uh, I have one minute, that's my time. All right, um, a letter that I sent and I stand by that letter passionately because I have seen too many close calls and I have been, uh, try to be a proactive part of taking care of this situation and addressing the situation in this town as a resident, as a taxpayer, as a parent of children going to the schools. And um, I'm tired. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of being set back. I'm tired of bureaucracy, quite frankly. And um, if there are things in the works, actually, thank you. We have corresponded. We have corresponded. There's something, I know there's a, a meeting happened and something is forthcoming with the police department and uh, Ms. Buckman, thank you, Mickey. And, um, and uh, Guilford Mooring, I believe, and Jeremy Anderson, another parent has been uh, also part of uh, trying to a solution. So I look forward to that and thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. I see no other hands for public comment at this time. Okay, with that, then we are going to go to the consent agenda. And as Athena is putting it up, I wanna just reiterate something I sent to counselors when I sent you the timing. This is a very long consent agenda. And there are two items on it that have multiple parts to those items. One is regarding intergovernmental agreements and the other is regarding committee appointments. If you would like to take a piece of one of those out, you may. You do not need to take the whole thing out. So that's gonna be my first question after we look at the whole, I'm not reading this whole thing. I like to have a voice left at the end of the evening. Um, but in addition to that, if you would like to just say, gee, when we get to that item on the regular agenda, could we just hear a little more about it? You may also do that, okay? So with that, we've chosen these following items uh, because we considered them to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. 
So I'm going to go through the process to remove an item. Uh, you have to raise your hand and ask that it be removed using the guidance that I just gave you. That doesn't require a second. The first is the adoption of the 2023 Juneteenth Proclamation, 6A. 6B is adoption of the citation in recognition of Arwen King. I will mention Arwen is with us tonight and we are going to actually read the proclamation and uh, join in congratulating her. Um, so even if you approve it on this, there will be something later, okay? As there will be for the others. The 6C is to amend a previously adopted 2023 Race Amity Day proclamation and it's basically to change the time and location. Um, 8A is approval of the Eversource petition to install a new pole on Dickinson Street, approximately 33 feet southerly of existing pole 35-2 and approximately 16 feet easterly of the Dickinson Street center line. That is what we just went through. 8E is referral of a council order FY23 dash 078 and order appropriating the FY 2024 Community Preservation Act budget as required under Mass General Law Chapter 40B, 44B to the Finance Committee. That's merely a referral. 8F, I'm going to let you read it for yourself. It includes all 12 intergovernmental agreements. 8G is approval of long-term requests for the use of the public way for the Amherst Mobile Market. This is, I believe, the third or fourth year they have come to us for this kind of approval. 8H is a waiver of Section 8 and 9, Sections 8 and 9 of the Town Council Policy on making recommendations for Town Council appointments to multiple member bodies to allow follow-up questions of applicants during interviews. This comes from CRC and 8I is adoption of amendments to town council policy on making recommendations to town council appointments appointments to multiple member bodies. Uh, and then finally uh, is, I'm sorry, is 9A, 1 through 15, it's not finally. And that is the approval of committee appointments. I believe there are 15 of them. And then finally, it's the approval of three different sets of minutes that come from May 15th, 2023. Is there any item that people would like to be removed and voted on later? Okay. Is there any item that people would like to have a little more discussion about when it comes up on the agenda? Okay, then we're going to move to a vote. You just shortened your evening. You have to make the motion. Uh, right, so I move uh, the following items and the printed motions they're under and approve those items as a single unit. And I'm not going to repeat them. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Dorothy, do you have a question? You're muted, Dorothy. Um, that was just a second. I want to offer a second as well. Thank you. Okay, so we're moving to the vote. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, and I. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Um, Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. It's unanimous for the nine of us that are here. Um, Thank you. Uh, I Since Anika is not here, I have asked one of the other sponsors of the um, proclamation for Juneteenth to read the last paragraph. Alicia? Yes, thank you, Lynn. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim June 19th, 2023 as Juneteenth in Amherst. 
and we invite the Amherst community to join us for a weekend full of celebratory events that honor our history and our community. And we encourage the community to view Amherst Civil War tablets located in the Bang Center to honor all our residents who served in the Civil War. Thank you. Um, we also, we would now like to have Arwen King come up and sit in the chair. <laughs> I was told, Arwen, that last night uh, you were honored at Hopkins Academy for the Hadley Girl Scouts and that Athena O'Keefe was present at that because she is involved with Girl Scouts and with, as, a, as well as her daughter. So we have a special citation for Arwen King upon receipt of the Gold Award Girl Scout. And it is sponsored by myself and Jennifer Taub. Uh, and the community sponsor is the Girl Scouts of Central and Western Mass. So very briefly, what I'd like to do, right, instead of reading the entire thing, is just describe that Arwen's project that she did for this highest award in scouting was free to be 83. Gold Award project, it educates the public about type 1 diabetes low carb eating and how it can be highly beneficial, a highly beneficial diet that can increase quality of life for diabetics. The project consists of distributing informational pamph pamphlets, developing and publishing instructional videos and on low carb cooking, connecting with local people for workshops and more. And Arwin will also be honored in a region wide event on June 15th at Mechanics Hall in Worcester. So mm. we conclude this. Jennifer, do you want to read the final portions of it? Yeah. Now, therefore, here is the South County, second time spent congratulating Arlene King on her achievement of the Girl Scout Gold Award. And further, we instruct the clerk of the American Scout Council to send a copy of this citation. So I'd like all the counselors that are here, if we could just gather and have Arlen get a quick picture. Ah. Thank yes. you so much. We congratulate you. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Um, we are going to move on to the action items. The first one we've already done, and that's the poll. So we're going to go on to some budget items. Now, let me just mention, we're not voting tonight on the budget, okay? Or any of the following. Uh, well, no, we're not voting on the budget. But I do want to recognize uh, both Sean Mangano and Paul for the development of this budget and Andy for working through it with the finance committee and actually just recognized that several counselors came to just about every finance committee meeting. So, and you learn a lot when you're there. So uh, I really wanna thank the committee and thank the counselors that were able to attend. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean and Andy uh, to talk about the, the budget. And um, Sean, do you wanna start or Andy? I don't. I'm I don't. 
I don't have anything formal prepared, but happy to answer any questions or um, give some highlights of what we talked about. Okay. Andy? Yeah, I hadn't prepared anything either because I think that the report was sufficient to uh, cover the issues and I think that uh, counselors are aware of what the most difficult issues are from just the conversations that have had and from public comment that we've received. Uh, when we had the hearing, there were oh, really only two topics that were subject of uh, the public comment that was received during the hearing. And those issues were carefully considered and I think explained in the report. So rather than go through it again, um, just as, as Sean has indicated, respond to questions. Okay. Uh, and we have questions. Uh, Dorothy. Um, first of all, the, the reports were incredible. Um, and really, you should congratulate yourself mightily, Andy, and you and your committee in pulling it together. Um, my question is about, uh, I, I could read here and there about the special COVID funds here in some that are coming, some that are going. I'm hearing in the paper about the phrase clawing back COVID funds. Are there any such funds that the town has that we thought we had, which maybe we're going to lose, that are going to cause us a problem? Um, this question may be for Paul more than Andy, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I hear this phrase a lot, and I'm just kind of you know, hoping it's not going to cause us a big problem. I'm going to start with Paul and then whomever else you would like to call on, Paul. Yeah, thank you, Dorothy. Yes, it's something we've been paying very close attention to, and we've been in touch with uh, very on a daily basis with Gov uh, Congressman McGovern's office as well. The mm -hmm. funds that we have are not subject to this clawback pr provision at this point in time. And if they were to be moving in that direction, we have a backup plan to make sure that they don't get clawed back. Thank Sean, you. Sean has, Sean has taken care of all that. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Jennifer. Uh, thank you. So the first thing I, I did want to acknowledge um, Andy and the whole committee for the report, <clears throat> because I'm not a finance person, but I could really understand it. <laughs> so I know a lot of work went into that. So thank you. Um, I did have a question. Well, on page 13, where um, you were discussing under public works and the budget and what we could do to really address sidewalks and roads. And you laid out three options very clearly. And the third one would be to, um, I guess, like almost form a consortium of other uh, municipalities in the, in the county or in the area. You said to incentivize increased asphalt production by forming a regional association with other towns and develop a multi-year plan. Um, how might we, you know, if we want to pursue one of these options, maybe particularly this one happening, how how would we do that? So it's not just a suggestion, but we might really be able to move that forward. Andy, do you want to start? I'll I'll briefly do so, and then I don't know if uh, Sean uh, wants to sure. say anything thing on the subject. Uh, but one of the members of the committee was particularly um, attuned to the subject because we realized that one of the difficulties has been that the cost of road construction has been increasing at a rate faster than we can um, handle. And so that those um, suggestions had come from um, one committee member in particular with some discussion. And it wasn't necessarily that um, we could get there, but I think that it was a call to be creative and to give examples of what we might think about as far as whether there is another um, way that could reduce the price and get us a little bit farther with the roads for the money we have available. Uh, we don't know that it can be done, uh, but it was sort of a call to be uh, creative. And uh, I don't know, Sean, do you have anything else you wanna add? Yeah, um, so I interpreted this one as um, sort of scale and uh, partnering with other communities to uh, basically solicit a bigger paving contract 
um, in the hopes of maybe attracting more firms to the area. Um, I think one of the things we've been dealing with is that there's limited there's limited firms that do this work in the area. And the thought was maybe if there's a bigger contract, um, maybe somebody from a little bit farther away might be willing to come closer, or maybe we'd be more competitive with other areas um, if we had one big contract as opposed to a bunch of little contracts. Um, so it's certainly something uh, we'll be looking into that requires some coordination. Um, and you know, it's something we'll see if it's feasible. Jennifer, please go ahead. Um, so would this be something that um, I know staff has, you know, we're always asking staff to put more on your plate. Is this something that council might, you know, form a committee to, to look at or would be counselors and, you know, residents, but, you know, again, how can we really kind of work to explore, make this or some other option just to explore options since this is kind of the number one priority for a lot of the residents. I Let me just jump in and say, having discussed this with the town manager probably more times than he wants to talk about it, um, and I'm not even the counselor that suggested the regional approach, <laughs> um, the, the first thing we need to do is when we develop our financial guidelines for FY25 is make, determine if this is going to be a priority at the level that we need it to be. And then uh, my guess at that point is we would turn to the town manager along with the staff and say, come back to us with a proposal for how to move forward. Uh, and that the purpose of the report was to just capture some of the essence of that conversations that while, while we were there. Um, further question? Okay, Kathy. I'll just make one additional comment because I think it's already in the report, but if the public is listening there, this came up in the capital joint capital planning committee discussion that there are only a few suppliers of road and pavement. And so having someone increase the scale, put more teams on would mean they need to be guaranteed work because you don't hire staff and, and gear up. So if you could get to a bigger scale continuously, the, the thought was then you, you might be able to have more responsiveness. We compete, Amherst competes with the state, we compete with other towns um, for any road we're, we're going out. So, uh, so my comment was not about this. So I, mm -hmm. I just want to make one that I think runs through the report, but what became clear has been come, coming clearer as we do this over the years is we have an amazing staff working for the town of Amherst in all walks, uh, library, schools, including the town staff, DPW, where they're often working short staffed um, because of turnover. Um, and if people are doing more than one job, very cheerfully, I might add. So we potentially face a long-term challenge. We particularly have a long-term challenge in areas like DPW, where there's a private market for road engineers, for heavy equipment drivers. So it, it goes through across the report. So the cost of tar is going up to repair a road, but people the cost of people and retaining people. So we, we've got a wage study out um, to start looking at this, but it's quite remarkable how much we, um, how much staff gives to us. The planning department's been down two key people. And for many of us, it would seem invisible because they seem to still be able to come to all of our meetings <laughs> to prepare reports. So I just want to do a shout out for the people who, work for all of us. Um, and that becomes clear in this month of May where we get to hear from all of them. Thank you. Pam, or, or Andy, did you wanna respond? Yeah, just in the end, and actually Kathy covered some, um, a lot of what I was gonna say. Um, Guilford is I think still in the audience and I wanna really credit uh, from what I know, both Guilford and uh, uh, just, Jason Skeeling, uh, the town engineer, because I really think that they work very hard to try and structure bids so that multiple projects that we are bidding for get into a larger pool and make us more competitive. 
And uh, one of the examples is that uh, when there's an athletic uh, need for paving, like the basketball courts at Mill River, for example, or the uh, upcoming installation with uh, CPA money for the uh, pickleball courts, uh, to make sure that those get included in road paving contracts so that everything that we're doing as a town gets bundled together. But in the end, uh, as was explained to us very clearly, uh, we're still competing with the Commonwealth. And uh, the uh, Mass DOT uh, puts out contracts that are so large that no municipality of our size or even uh, larger size communities can compete with uh, what Mass DOT is putting out there. And uh, so it's, it's a difficult uh, problem. And what we're really just asking for is to think about creativity in uh, broadening beyond Amherst to see if we can partner uh, in some way to, to address that issue. And uh, we don't know that it's possible, but it was the one thing that came up in discussion that we thought could be done. Okay, Pam. Thank you, and I'm gonna also thank the committee and all the hard work that went into making that report and the decisions. Um, so it, I was building on Jennifer's question about, about uh, um, funding for roads and sidewalks. Um, so it sounds like, you know, we have the list of a, at least a dozen uh, intergovernmental agreements that the town manager has on his on his plate now to go do. Um, so given that this probably can't happen until the financial guidelines of FY25, it would also not be able to get on his to do list until uh, we're closer to that date. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I think it would take some time to put to, to get this communities who are interested in participating to align their procurement processes and their appropriation processes. Um, I think, you know, I think that we may be also be looking at this as statewide. I'm on the uh, Mass MMA's um, uh, Committee on Public Works. So it's something I'll bring up there as well, because I think we're not the only ones in this boat. And there are other communi communities as well who might be exploring this. But yeah, I think the timing is, you're accurate on the timing. We're really not talking about this summer at all. Dorothy. Uh, I just want to underscore that, and I, I know how hard people are working on this, but you know, this is my fifth year in the council and I ran on sidewalks. People are now getting um, frantic um, and their comments are more aggressive. Um, they are just running out of patience and um, they're despairing. And I, I tell them that, that the town is working on this issue and there are many, many problems. But to the you know average person who walks and drives around here, um, it seems like it's just all falling apart. And so I just want to stress what you were talking about was a new approach. We need to have, it's a very challenging thing, the, the rising prices, competing with the state, but somehow... We've got to come up with some way to deal with this because um, they're questioning the validity of having a town council because our roads are falling apart. I mean, it's it's getting, I just haven't seen it this bad as it has been recently. So, and I'm sure you have had some of the same reactions, but new new approaches and new thoughts, I think would be really great. Thank you. Are there any other comments with regard to the budget? The budget will come up for a vote at next uh, at the council meeting next Monday, the 12th. Uh, and um, with that, uh, then we will go on to uh, a couple council orders that we have to approve. Uh, these came back from the finance committee. And um, so we'll start with the first one, which is council order FY24-11 and order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY24. 
uh, to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY24-11, an order approving the acceptance of optional tax exemptions for FY 2024 as recommended by the Finance Committee report of June 5th, 2023 and shown on page 15 of the motion sheet. Is there a second? Second. Okay, are there any questions or comments? I'm going to just add one piece and that is we do go to the maximum the state allows in these areas. So um, right now we are not legally not allowed to go any higher. Okay, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we are going to vote on this tonight. Uh, I will begin with Anna Devlin Gothier. Hi, you haven't switched the order up today. You're killing me. <laughs> Well, it's because I've got <laughs> several absences. That's okay. So That's okay. I'm trying not to rotate as well. Still an I. Still an I. Okay. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an I. Mandy Johanneke. Hi. Anika Lopes is absent. And where's absent? Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. It's unanimous with nine councils, councillors present and four councillors absent. The next council order is regarding our setting our water and sewer rates, effective July 1. So in this is the motion in accordance with general bylaw 3.62, water use regulations having heard public comment specific to the proposed amendments on June 5th, 2023, Notice of which, whoops, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm going to read the motion, but we still have to have public comment. Um, uh, notice of which was posted on the town bulletin board for at least 10 days on May 17th and notice of amendment published in the newspaper on May 22nd, 2023 to amend the water use regulation to Appendix A as follows by replacing April 18, 2023 with July 1, 2023, by replacing domestic water rates 475 per 1,000 per 100 cubic feet with domestic water rates um, $5 per 100 uh, cubic feet, by replacing water rate $4.75 per 100 cubic feet, with agricultural water rate $5 per 100 cubic feet. Is there a second? And then we're not going to vote yet. Second. Okay. All right. Is there any public comment with regard to water rates? Water and sewer rates, I'm sorry. Are there any counselor questions or comments? Pam Rooney. Yeah, it was unclear to me why the agricultural water rate is the same as the residential, if I'm hopefully not mistaken. That that seems to be um, given its use and its purpose and its and its benefits to the community, it doesn't seem that agricultural use should be at the same rate as residential. Sean, do you have any response? I don't Guilford is not Yeah, I, I think the difference is um and I wish Gilbert was here. I wish I think the difference is the agricultural rate. They don't pay a sewer um, rate for it; it's just the water. Um, generally, the way the, the billing works is um, if you have the water, there's a certain percentage that automatically is billed as sewer. Um, but for agricultural, there's no sewer component, which is logical considering it's not Does that going, help? going into the sewer system. Pam, well, that doesn't answer why why their rate should. Still be higher than residential. It's not. It's not higher, is it? It's not so. higher. It's the same as. Yeah. Um, Andy, go if ahead. I, if I may, uh, we had a quite a uh, substantial discussion about this, as to actually even creating separate rates back when I was on the select board. So I really have to go spin backwards a little bit in time to fully answer the question. Um, but the sewer is the problem. 
the concern that was coming from the agricultural community was that we were charging a single rate um, for um, agriculture and non-agricultural. Um, and of course, the uh, when there's an agricultural use, that water does not go in the sewer. And therefore, charging a sewer fee uh, is not, uh, you know, was raised as you're charging for service that's not being utilized. And so, uh, so the division was to try and at least offer the agricultural community a mechanism so that they could um, have a separate water and sewer system that would allow uh, not paying the sewer rate on the uh, on that portion of the water that is being used for purely agricultural purposes. And uh, that required an additional step, which was that you had to offer uh, those uh, customers the opportunity to divide their water in an acceptable way so that you would meter the water that was going for the um, residents or other facilities where the water would be going back into the sewers from the water that was being used for purely agricultural purposes. Um, and uh, so the mechanism was established to allow the agriculture, uh, agricultural community, if they wished, to do those changes to their system and have two separate meters. And to do that, then we needed to have separate rates for each. But the uh, challenge then was that the cost of producing the water, getting the water from uh, the water source and uh, treating the water ended up being the same because you're still treating the water. So it wasn't about the water rates, it was about whether or not you'd be charging sewer, uh, but it became two separate pieces of water delivery. But the costs for producing water are the same regardless of which way, what the use of it is. And I think that was the uh, uh, analysis that was going on at the time. And uh, so I hope that helps. Does it help? Okay. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to rotate on it. Get ready. Okay. Um, Lynn Griesmer is an I. Mandy Johanneke. I. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Bernie. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. It's unanimous with nine counselors voting and four absence. Uh, and then finally, uh, the next one is about the sewer rate. So in accordance with general bylaw, 3.61 sewer use regulations, having heard public comments specific to the proposed amendments on Jan uh, June 5th, 2023, notice of which was posted on the town bulletin board for at least 10 days on May 17th, and notice of amendments published in the newspaper on May 22nd, 2023, to amend the sewer use regulations appendix A as follows by replacing April 18th, 2023 with July 1, 2023, by replacing domestic sewer rates $5.20 per 100 cubic feet with domestic sewer rate $5.50 um, per 100 cubic feet. Is there a second? Second. Is there any public comment with regard to the sewer use regulations or sewer rates? Are there any questions from the council? Ah, yes. 
You have a, a comment with regard to sewer rates. Yeah. Um, Please come forward. Please come forward, state your name, where you live, and then proceed with your comments. Lynn Connor, um, 175 Summer Street. You have to need, is, and, the, is the green button on? Yeah, the green okay. button is on. Great. It's green, or the button is green. Um, um, since you've um, opened up your meetings to in-person public comments, um, what I would like to suggest in order for the public to truly understand and effectively comment on the items on your agenda, I would just urge the board to post in the rear of the meeting um, a copy of your, your agenda for whatever meeting takes place where, where public um, the public is physically present, a copy of the agenda so that the public can, can read and see what actually is being proposed in writing and make intelligent, effective comments. So I, it, it, you know, the agenda isn't that long. It's hopefully not 20 pages long. And if you, post copies back there for the public to read as they come in. I think it would encourage people to participate. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Vince. Are there any other comments at this time? Are there any questions from counselors? Seeing none, then I'm going to start this time with Mandy Jo Haneke. Hi. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Anna Devlin Gothier. Yes. And Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous with nine counselors voting in favor and um, four counselors absent. Let me just take a moment to catch up with my items on the agenda. There's one more motion related to this. Uh, Shall I read it? Uh, yeah. To the adopt approval order. I move to adopt approval order FY 2410 and order setting water and sewer rates to be effective July 1, 2023. Thank you. As recommended by the Finance Committee report of June 5, 2023, and shown on page 16 of the motion sheets. Second. Thank you. I realize what I did. Um, are there any questions or comments? Okay, then we will move to a vote. Yes. This is actually the rates. So, so we had to amend the bylaw or the regulations, and then we also have to vote the rates because the rates are listed in the regulations too. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I, sorry about that. Um, okay. We're starting with uh, Dorothy Pam. Okay. Um, I had my hand up for a quick comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead, Dorothy. This is for all public viewers. We are not just blindly voting yes to a whole pile of stuff. We have talked over these items individually in committee meetings. And many of them have been talked about in two or three committees. And we're not just sitting here saying yes. Uh, so I could see somebody who tuned in and, and think, what the heck? They just all say yes to everything. But this is after many, many, many meetings and many uh, pieces of paper written on it. So my answer is yes, I, I vote yes. Every one of these has been referred to a committee before it comes back to the council with a recommendation from the committee uh, as to what they feel the council should consider. So your vote was yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier? Yes. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke? Aye. 
Okay. Now, am I right? <laughs> okay. We have referred the next one. We've approved the intergovernmental agreements. Uh, we approved the public way for the mobile market. We approved the changes with regard to um, multiple member body appointments with what CRC is getting ready to do. And we are now moving on to item number nine. We actually already approved all of the appointments. In the consent agenda and item 10 on the agenda is committee and liaison reports. Um, Community Resources Committee, Mandy Jo. Um, I kind of made it during announcements of the extra special meetings, one next Monday at 4.30 p.m. for planning board interviews, and one on Thursday, the 15th, 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 at 11.30 a.m. for ZBA interviews. Um, we're continuing our review of the um, rental permitting, and that will be the subject of this week's meeting. Um, we are hoping to have a legal review by tomorrow night um, to be able to discuss that at the meeting. And on the 22nd is the continued public hearing on the zoning bylaw amendments. Um, Pam Rooney. Yeah, this is sort of a point of order. I just spoke with the attendee who was hoping to make a public comment and um, missed the original public comment session um, due to having to give someone a ride. So I wondered if, if somewhere in our, in our agenda, there's an opportunity for public comment. I know we've passed that time, but I'm just asking. Um, if we do, it will be after we get done with the rest of our items. Okay. It, this is somebody in the audience by Zoom. Oh, okay. Um, so CRC, any other comments or questions? Uh, elementary School Building Committee, Kath, yes. I also wanted to remind folks that Mandy sent out a request to review the ZBA interview questions and any comments should go back to Mandy since she's the one that sent that, that email and apologize for the late, uh, the late notice of that. Thank you. Um, elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. There will be a meeting at the end of next week, not this week of the full committee on Friday. This week at noon, we have a subcommittee that's focusing on the building and there are a variety of issues, including uh, the, the windows and the gym a canopy on the outside that, that are listed on the agenda. And all of those are open to anyone to come and listen and send us comments. There will be next week, and we haven't scheduled the specific time yet, a site subcommittee meeting that will be a collection of lots of issues that have been raised around the community fields, the athletic fields, the playgrounds, um, some of them, um, Pam submitted some questions about the, the way the parking lot is laid out and the designer will, team will come in with the collections. The subcommittees are not making decisions. They will bring the issues that have been heard to the full committee. And this is all in, just so people understand, we're in a phase called, I, I call it detailed design, but it's, um, we had the basic schematic, but now we're really down to exactly how big is this exactly what is the location um you know we um because the the and anything that has a cost implication we're asking questions about um are there different ways of doing it and what are the cost implications so those are all posted but if anyone has questions i'll be happy to answer them um by email just email me okay are there any questions at this time uh, then Finance Committee. Andy, anything else at this point? I think that the one thing that I wanted to do is to uh, point out what the agenda is for the meeting that we have scheduled for Friday at one o'clock. 
so that um, uh, counselors, members of the community are aware of it if they haven't seen the posting. Um, there are essentially four items plus the standard types of things that are on the agenda minutes prior meetings that are ready for approval public comment uh, in particular but um, the four items that I wanted to just alert you to are one is counselor compensation uh, that was uh, a um, recommendation for discussion by uh, counselors Miller and Walker and uh, it was referred to the finance committee almost at exactly the same time the budget was referred and uh, we therefore um, put it off until after we could complete the work on the budget but we needed to do it fairly quickly thereafter because as you um, probably know the uh, charter has um, a deadline date that the way that the charter is provided is that any increase in compensation has to be um, voted by one council during its first 18 months um, and um, it would if approved subject to um, appropriation then be in effect for the next council and so if this council is to consider it it has to uh uh, do it, I think, July 2nd or 3rd, something like that. Second. And uh, so uh, I just wanted to point that out. There is a piece of the compensation proposal that actually was adopted in the budget and is not um, subject to the charter. And that was about um, um, family care. And, uh, but any other part of it. So that's item one. Item two was a referral that was made today, and so I don't need to tell you any more about it because it was in your packet on the CPA committee recommendations uh, to transfer um, remaining funds into an FY24 reserve. I think that was adequately explained. Item three is something that we get to every um, three months uh, because it's quarterly reports. So we're um, going to receive and discuss the third quarter FY23 revenue and expense report, uh, which uh, will be in the packet for the um, committee meeting. And uh, then when after we've referred it, we will make sure it's in the packet for the next council meeting also. And um, then the other is we need to hand, address our own scheduling issues for the um, side when we're scheduling meetings for the remainder of 2023. So um, those are the four principal discussion items for this week's meeting. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, the only thing I want to edit is we didn't adopt the budget yet, but when it comes up next week, that budget includes a line item for family care. And so that line item would be available as soon as the budget was is adopted, even for this council. Okay. Um, but starting July 1. But not until July 1. Right. Thank you. Uh, GOL. Uh, Anika's not here. Jennifer? Oh, Pat's not here. You mean Pat? Oh, I'm sorry. Pat's not here. Sorry. Jennifer. <laughs> Um, yeah, so brief update, the uh, GOL met on May 24th, and we've been discussing um, town policy for flags, for signs and banners, as well as parade um, parades. This is a discussion that's in progress, so I have nothing definitive um, to report at this time. The committee um, also reviewed the proposed bylaw that was refer referred to it at the last council meeting for ensuring safe access to legally protected, reproductive, and gender-affirming health care services, and we uh, sent that to the town attorney for legal review. Um, and what I can report in terms of uh, action taken is that um, GOL has spent several meetings um, updating the gen general bylaw 3.40, which is currently called snow and ice removal. And um, after you know much discussion and um, input from from the public and some other town committees, 
um, we voted at the uh, last meeting to actually repeal and replace. We had so many changes to the recommended changes to the proposed bylaw that we voted to repeal and replace it with new uh, bylaw language for 3.40. And we are now it, um, proposing that it be called obstruction of the public ways and snow and ice removal. And the name is proposed to be changed because um, obstruction of the public ways can among other items um, include vegetative overgrowth, which can also block sidewalks and other public ways, causing pedestrians you know, to have to walk in the street and around um, the obstruction. And I might just also ask, um, add as I'm um, already amazed in terms of um, emails and inquiries I get from constituents in my district that I've already had to refer to this bylaw several times. Um, I got an email a couple of days ago about broken bottles on the sidewalk and the question was asked, it's been there for a few days, when is the town gonna come and clear it? And referring to this bylaw, said that it's you know the public way in front of private property that it would be that property owner's um, responsibility to, to clear the debris. So we um, had hoped to have, well, we had hoped to have that uh, recommendation for the new uh, language for, the, for this general bylaw uh, referred to the council for a first reading next Monday on June 12th, but we did get a couple of comments back from the town council Town, I'm sorry, no, town the, attorney. The, the town attorney, yeah. the council, yes, with a SEL, yes, yeah, right. the town attorney. So I think we can review it at our meeting this Wednesday and then maybe still have it come back if we're ready. Right. Yeah. If we, so that's what we're aiming for. And um, yeah, so that would be, um, oh, and we also, as part of uh, when we voted on this new language, we'll, we'll now have to tweak based on the town attorney's uh, comments but we are also including that it would be the responsibility of inspection services to enforce obstruction of the public way. Um, and now it's currently being done by the police department. Okay. So, yes, Are there any questions? Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, Jones Library Building Committee, uh, Anik is not here, Paul. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the next meeting of the Jones Library Building Committee is on Thursday at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's in person at the Jones Library Woodbury Room. At this meeting, they will be looking at exterior bricks because it's an in-person meeting. They want to actually show the actual bricks they're talking about. And they'll be talking about the second floor ramp, which has been a subject of conversation. The meeting after that uh, will be June 15th at 4.30. That's the following Thursday. Are there any questions regarding that, Kathy? Um, I have a couple questions, um, and not specifically, Paul, on the meeting you just described, but I'm wondering whether uh, we can get um, a fuller committee report in July on the status of the costs um, and where we are on the building more more generally and i i know there's i've been following the amount of grants that have come in and so the the the, the expand and renovate and also i would like to know how much work we've been able to do on what if we can't go forward looking at um uh failing hvac systems leaking roofs and other things so just um, Lynn, I'm trying to find some space just to get a report where there may not be answers. And then my my last question, just because I had a couple of people ask, um, if the larger project goes through, the timing of it, and thinking of what's going to happen to Amity Street and what's going to happen to the center of town, and when we're doing the work on the North Commons and what's going to happen to the center of town, there was a article in the Gazette on the big plan for the Northampton Main Street, and it was a commentary, and the commentator said, we we're going to lose businesses for three years at the rate the work on the streets is going to go on. You know, so just on something on um, the amount of debris that is going to have to be taken off, just some comment. Again, I'm looking for just a report that would say, "Have has anyone looked at these issues? What, where are they? Um, uh, and 
in that larger package, I know because we've seen pieces of it, the terms of the grant are the library has to be operational while it's closed. So you've been searching for space and trying to find space we can afford. So just something that would do a July more refined update before we wait till the bids come back mm -hmm. or the new estimates, you know, so that we're more in a path of at least early alert system. So that's just a request, Lynn, on finding space, but also the committee would have to put together, you know, 15 minutes or something that could cover a range of issues. Thank you. And actually, we have been trying to determine when the best time to bring that report back to the mm -hmm. council should, would be. Uh, and I took special note of the particular issues you want to make sure we address. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else, Paul? Any other comments or questions? Um, okay, and then we have TSO and uh, Anna, you're prepared on that one? I am. So TSO, um, one thing of note, especially because it came up today in our last meeting, we had a discussion regarding Cushman Scott um, and the possible paths forward. And so I want to uh, appreciate Paul for working to set up meetings with his staff and the folks at Cushman Scott to figure out what are some options for us moving forward. But um, TSO did have that discussion at our last meeting. We also are continuing to work on the uh, streetlights proposal that'll be coming for a vote from the committee at the next meeting. And we received updates on uh, the waste hauler, uh, waste hauler progress from that. That's continuing to move forward as well. And then lastly, we approved, I believe, 26 uh, committee appointments. So we are rocking on that front as well. Bless you, Mandy Jo. Sorry, I'm, I'm like watching everybody. Uh, Kathy, Anna, here. would you just repeat your second item? Uh, Cushman Scott streetlights. We street are lights. Thank yep, you. street lights. That's We're planning to uh, uh, bring that forward to a vote next for the for the TSO committee at our next meeting on the fifteenth. So you're saying June for the June twelfth agenda? Sorry, yes. Okay. Well, uh, um, hang on, I got I didn't have my calendar. We're looking at doing the no. Uh, it'll come back to TSO on the 15th. It won't come back to the council till after that. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Are there any liaison, any questions, Kathy? 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 Yeah, this is a looking forward question, Anna, um, sure. that I don't think it's on your horizon yet. So we heard earlier comments about the Cushman School and the speed along that street. That came to JCPC as a resident proposal to do, do some address. And we had two or three others that were around the speed and whether we could do speed humps, bumps, whatever we want to call them. And we bundled them on saying we would like to have a look. So we called them cut through streets where you, if you go this way, you can get to the place you want to go a little faster you're avoiding an intersection. So we've got some, there are other places in town. So what I'm wondering is if there is a way of expediting consideration of this as either a package, um, it is a public way set of issues. Uh, police and police had already been out to Cushman to talk about at the point we were talking about it in February. Right. So what I'm worried about is that things just sit and residents bring them to us. And we weren't able to deal with it in JCPC because it needed a more uniform uh, set of issues. I mean, a school is a different one, you know, on speed limits. So it's, it's a combination of the speed limit on the road and the ability to go quickly on the road if you don't put a speed hump on it, that people just ignore the speed limit because they're hurrying to get to the next point. So trying to create a way, because it's not a bylaw change, it's really working with town staff to say, let's let's orchestrate a way to start looking at some of these issues rather than having them fester. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we had talked about in TSO were the the different guiding regulations that are on a on a level beyond just town, right? That it come from the state or that are 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 national, right? In terms of where things where things like school zones get placed and those don't apply to um, to early child care centers. That they, they don't kind of count qualify for school zone 
um, signage. And so uh, that's something that I know Paul and, and his staff are, are bringing forward. But one thing that Kathy, I'm hearing you say is that it would be helpful to maybe ask Paul for a report back to TSO um, at a, at, in a couple meetings or once he figures out when that date, when that initial meeting with the um, residents will be. I don't know, Paul, if you're amenable to that, but we, we can discuss it at TSO more formally, but uh, I think it would be, that would be helpful to get a report back. Okay, Paul, did you want to comment? Yeah, I think that, I mean, Kathy's pointing to a more general um, question about um, speeding issues throughout the town that need, that people are asking counselors to be addressed. And we don't really have a really terrific way of handling those. And I think mm -hmm. you're talking, I think Kathy's saying, is there a systemic way systematic way that we can take them on and process them so people get satisfactions kind of instead of them sort of lingering for too long. I think that's the goal. And we made a few suggestions just a way of thinking about it, Paul, in the JCPC report, you know, it's a cluster and we call them cut through streets. You're like if I can avoid that street lamp, street light and intersection if I go this way, but there are a few others and we address them one at a time and the resident proposals, just so people know, I mean, we've got a cap on how much a resident proposal can be. These are all within the limits of what we could fund, but we don't fund them at JCPC because we don't want to just do this one and not that one. You know, we, we're trying to figure out some way of, of identifying them and then having a schedule that we're going to do them in the following order. So thank, thank you. you. Jennifer? So I just want, I guess, clarification. So the the um, issue with the Cushman School has been referred to TSO. I mean, is that it has not been not? referred to TSO? Okay. So how do we move forward with that? Paul? So yeah. So staff is uh, scheduling a meeting with the um, people here who are here tonight and with others. Um, you know, we, we as a staff have met because there were some. A disconnect between what the police were saying and what the town engineer was saying. So we we finally we were talking together and now willing to able to meet with them and have a more coherent conversation. So every one of these things that come up, there's an there's an there's a if you say, oh, I'm gonna inhibit people from driving down this street, they move to a different street. And then those people will get upset or something like that. There's always a, a, it's an unintended consequence or it, it, it's a, maybe it's an intended consequence. So there, and there's also, as um, Anna said, you know, there, the town has to comply with the uniform manual of traffic control devices in terms of what qualifies for a stop sign, what qualifies for a yield sign. This is a national thing that the Department of Transportation does. If we wanna put up the signs, it has to comply with that. And the logic is, is simple to understand in that we can't have our own set of rules in the town of Amherst and then the town of Hadley has a totally different set of rules. There has to be sort of um, alignment with, with what, when you expect to see a stop sign, when you expect, expect to see um, crosswalks and, and the notification. So it's a really gigantic document that, you know, a manual that the town engineer looks at and says, does this qualify? And then if you want to put up a certain sign, there are warrants that are required. Like it, they look at the average speed, they look at, you know, the number of accidents, the number of, of injuries that happened there. So it's not just people saying, I want this. It's because it, you have to have some data that supports your decision to do it because when we install things we then have to send it to the state and they say well what's your justification and it can't be you know people want it that's not good enough uh, when you do traffic engineering um so all those things start taken into consideration there are other things can be do other than traffic control devices you know um, uh, speed humps are, are, are one of those things um, but again, th that becomes, uh, it can become an issue because then people look for, for ways around those humps if they don't like them. And so, but it's just something you have to have a, a coherent conversation about. Um, because when you try to address one problem in one neighborhood, there's other problems in other, it, it can, not always, but it can create, sometimes it just does what you want. Uh, it slows down traffic, but I can tell you in <laughs> Um, we had a block party in Somerville and there are some speed, streets with speed homes and some who don't. And they're even finding that Waze directs, you know, because they see that the cars slow down, they put you down other streets, they direct you down other streets, and then those people will start to get upset. So we just have to think about as a, as a unit um, how this impacts our town. Pam? 
Thank you. It's exactly the topic. I really appreciate the, the explanation from Paul on the considerations that have to be taken. Um, I wrote early in the beginning of the meeting that um, we, we had talked about this at JCPC and there were concerns expressed that four or five residents of a particular area had, had collaborated and had each sent in their individual um, resident request for, for road work. And it happened to be addressing speeding. So I'm, I'm asking if it's not a JCPC resident request approach, A, why have that? Um, but B, how do we ask the town manager then to direct his staff and and the TAC perhaps probably um, to develop you know by the end of the summer or something develop the cluster of streets that are of real issue and and set an agenda for getting them out there to discuss and to get worked on um, because I I totally understand the frustration of the people who have asked and asked and asked for. Um, a, a fix and they haven't gotten it and they don't understand why the fix can't happen. Um, so I'm asking from a, a, the, re, the perspective of someone not on TSO, can we, the council, ask TSO to please put this on their agenda, talk about it, ask the town manager, what is our process for getting the ball rolling um, besides just meeting with the residents? And I'd really truly like an answer to that. Paul. So I can I can talk with the chair of TSO and put that as a, an agenda item. But I think I think what we're if, if I'm understanding you, what you're saying is is what is the process? Because people are frustrated by that they don't understand the process because we don't really have a good process. So people have gone through the JCPC approach. They don't they go to counselors and it's like we don't really tell you how how to do it well. And so that's what you're trying and that's that's a conversation with TSO can have. I was told that I shouldn't put that on the or ask to have it put on the TSO agenda. So this is what's frustrating me. Well, I think the, I, it's fine to have it, but I think we need to do it as an actual recognition and referral because um, if when committees start just kind of taking stuff up and then we need to decide, is that our priority or not? So I'm not saying it's so, not, believe me, I'm very sympathetic to this issue, so, Paul. So maybe we can put something on the council agenda for next week on Monday that has that meets this and that would be a referral to the a TSO referral committee. Referral to TSO and just make it official, okay? Yeah. Um, okay, um, anything further, Pam? Okay, are there any liaison reports? Okay, uh, we've approved the minutes. Uh, Paul has a written report in the um, thing and Paul. Yeah, I have a number of things. So first off, we have a cup of Joe on Friday from 8.30 to 10. We'll have our DEI director and assistant director. We're going to Try it on the town common. I haven't looked at the weather. If it's bad weather, we'll bring it into this room. Um, the um, and there's also a rainbow coffee hour coming up. That the, there'll be the first one. They're going to do this at the senior center. Uh, they're going to do one a month, and we hope that people will attend that. On um, July 1st is when we will be doing our Independence Day fireworks. That's a Saturday night, and it'll be at the same location at the university. Um, the staff is working very hard to organize that and um, make sure it comes off successfully. We had some glitches last year that we wanted to do better with. Um, the um, Tomorrow night at 6.30, I believe, um, the uh, Community Choice Aggregation is going to have their um, a presentation so the um, we'll have a little bit of an introduction, and then the consultants will be there um, from the Valley, from uh, Mass Power Choice, Paul Gromer, and they will talk about community choice aggregation, and that's an opportunity to ask questions or anything like that. So that's tomorrow, tomorrow night, Tuesday at six thirty. It's on Zoom. It's on the town's website. Um, the 
Um, we, as you all know, um, we had a pretty major fire um, on Friday around 4.30, lightning struck. Um, not sure exactly where it struck, but it was close enough to a couple barns on Meadow Street that really caused a significant fire, required a gigantic re response from uh, neighboring towns. Uh, police and fire were really terrific, just amazing to watch them organize instantaneously. Um, the outbuildings, the barns and silos are, are a loss um, for the family. It was the last dairy farm in Amherst. Um, and uh, but they were pretty good at they were able to save the structure of the main house the um the owner a 93 year old resident in a wheelchair was able to get out of the house safely and get across the street to a to a to shelter um there were 35 cows in the barn at the time they uh, one of the police officers were able to able to help the uh, far, the farmer there get the um, cows out they all were safe and then it became like a um Neighboring farms from all over the area came with their um, with their trucks to help move them to safe locations. So it was really a, a real community effort, both in fighting the fire and in helping um, the the owners. It's a it's a long standing family in the town of Amherst. Um, there's a GoFundMe page that has been very successful. People want to help help the family. It's 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 really a tragic situation to see your whole you know your family's legacy go up in smoke. Um, so, but just kudos to our firefighters who um, responded really well. And um, the good news is they saved the house, but the the a lot of the barns were filled with hay and things that just went up instantaneously. It was a very, very hot fire. So, um, and so I think that's all I have. Okay. Are there questions of the town manager? I'm sorry, Kathy, did you have your hand up? <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Go ahead. I just, just following up on fire, um, I went over there, we we know them, and not only did it destroy the bond, but it melted, it melted all their equipment, the um, including the stanchions where you milk the cows so that the cows got saved, but the ability to milk them is not there anymore. I mean, this and the silos, they just put in a hundred bales of hay. Um, and guess what burns really quickly? A <laughs> hundred bales of hay. So the silos are gone. Um, so this is a major disaster. But I had a couple questions and I sent them in ahead to Paul. Um, in the as usual, fantastic report you gave us on lots of issues. The permanent shelter, um, I was very surprised, and maybe I should have known, at a million dollar price tag for design and an eight to $10 million project. Um, I knew what, I had a sense of what we had paid to acquire the piece, but I, I don't know what the plan is on where that money is coming from. Is that a regional effort? Is that state money? So it was a, a funding issue because this is this is on par of building a major apartment building downtown. Um, when you say eight to ten million dollars, it's no longer a, a small a small structure. So that was question number one. And then my question number two is more a uh, process in. North Amherst, the north part of North Pleasant, where it comes up to the intersection of Pine and Meadow, there uh, has suddenly been a lot of work working on a sidewalk, relocating a bus station, and the residents who live right there uh, asked me, did I know about this? Because they went out and said, what are you doing? Where are you going? And the bus stop got moved. They, they were actually thankful for the moving of the bus stop because it was in someone's driveway. But I don't remember that coming all the way to the council with a yes, let's go, because they're changing and widening a sidewalk that was not as in as in bad repair as a few other sidewalks are. So I didn't remember that step at the council. 
And then my question was notification of abutters. And these are literally abutters, you know, they're, um, so each of them was calling each other and said, I went out and talked to them and they told me they're going to move down here. And did you know about this? Where do I found the bids? So it was, it's a process, Paul, because I didn't have an answer for them. So I sent it through as a, and, and you said you would do a background, but it, there, it seems to, I didn't have a good answer. So I didn't know how to get a good answer. Mm -hmm. So um, I provided some generic, some general information to to you and to the people who had written to me. Um, this is a project that had been in the works. It's been on the drawing boards for many, many years, apparently, what I'm told. Um, and they're doing some of these work, this work um, in in sections. So uh, the funds come from a. We put out a bid. Um, every year, and you, we sort of can renew it on a year-to-year -year basis, up to three years, uh, for asphalt and um, and concrete work throughout town. Because we have lots of different things that we need contractors to do, and once we get the bid, um, we can draw from off of that bid. So it's not we don't for a small project like this, we don't go out for a specific bid. It just doesn't make sense. So this is under that contract. Um, we're actually pretty fortunate that the, the contractor is abiding by the bid because the prices have increased pretty dramatically since they bid it three years ago. This is the last year uh, for that bid. The, um, you know, I was told that the, they had talked to all the, res the abutting residents, but if that's not the case, then I need to, I'll dig into that more. Um, I know that they had multiple conversations with people out there, individuals, and along with the tree warden, and they were trying to address many of the issues that people had had tried to address. So I will need to dig, dig into that a little bit more. Um, in terms of the shelter, it's a big number. I think we we're it's, it's going to be a big project. It's not expected that the town is going to put all that money into it. We will have to put a, 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 a certain amount into it probably through their CPA process. Um, but we've already talked to state officials about the level of investment that's needed if that's going if this is going to be a, a shelter, which it truly is a regional shelter um, in terms of this the level of expectation of what a project like this will cost. Um, you know, it's always better to be clear that this is not a cheap project is going to it's going to cost a fair amount of money. Whether you know eight or ten million dollars is the actual number, we don't have no idea on that at this point in time. We're just sort of ballpark parking to try and sort of set the standard for what we expect it might cost by the time we get to the point of actual construction, which is going to be many you know you know many years away. It's not going to happen overnight. There's a lot of fundraising and 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 um, um, a, a grant applications to move this forward. Kathy, is there anything else? Yeah. I think I succeeded in taking my hand down. Okay. Pam Rooney. I was I was going to follow up on the conversation about the sidewalk in North Amherst. Um, I happened to attend the, the tree committee meeting at that site, and we in fact spoke to a number of the res one resident who lived directly behind or adjacent to the existing. Uh, bus stop, and he was the. He actually said, "I'm glad it's moving." You know, but but why this particular project? What what established this as a priority? And I guess that, given given the number of concerns around town about paving and and sidewalks, I would have to also ask, how did this happen to become a priority? I, obviously, some grant money was was found. Um, and I wonder, it, uh, follow up on the on the VFW site, um, in that discussion of cost, can someone give an estimate of the number of bedrooms that will be produced? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, any other comment on that, Paul? No, that's, okay. that's good, good questions. Um, Dorothy Pam. Um, a new problem has come to my mind. Uh, it's, people have been bringing it up recently, which is we have been working very hard in, as a town of Amherst in establishing affordable um, big A apartments. Um, but then the question of are they all occupied has been brought up from two separate sources. And I'm just thinking that perhaps and I do understand it's very complicated. Uh, it's not just like, oh, here's somebody who needs an apartment and pop them in. I know it's a 
much more complicated system. But when we have us, our st stats on the number of affordable apartments in town, could we also include how many are occupied and how many are unoccupied? And try to get at the question of how do we keep it from having too many unoccupied affordable apartments? Yeah, it's a really good question because I think that question has come up. Um, so what we're finding is that a lot of the new apartment buildings that have affordable house, affordable units in them, uh, the, the market rents, rented property units go quickly, but the bandwidth that you have to, you have to make a certain amount of money, but you can't make too much money for the affordable ones is, is a narrower group of people who are seeking that, that rentals. Now they can't rent them for anything for anybody else. They can't put them on, onto the retail market. Um, how many are actually occupied? Um, I, the, you know, uh, or uh, yeah, uh, the, the affordable ones, we, we, we could probably try to collect that information. I'm not sure. I would have to talk to Nate Malloy on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kathy, I'm, I'm just going to follow up on that, Paul, and I'll send you a comment I heard and a contact that a builder who had to put affordable units in found it difficult to fill them because of the way the regulations work. And so it was sitting there with an empty unit, not because they didn't want to. So I'll just forward you. It's not the letter we got from a resident recently. This was from another source. So I didn't know, I wasn't gonna follow up on it because I didn't have any power to even give an answer to why that might happen. And it was a red tape issue, I think at, at a higher level than the Amherst level. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Dorothy. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we're moving on to town council comments. Um, I did not do my written report. I hope to do it by next week. Um, and, uh, but I'm open to any questions people have to ask or would like to ask. And then just a glimpse at our next agenda items. Some of these are not, um, um, some of these will be next week on the 12th. Some of them may not be until later and maybe not even till July, but definitely next week, we will be looking, we will be doing a public forum regarding the CPA money that was just referred to finance. We will uh, definitely be doing the budget, the operating, the capital budget, the financial orders for fire um, and for the pumps, for fire equipment and a financial order for pump um, at, num at pump number four, uh, CPA money. And the rest really is up to whether or not the committees are ready to bring things back. Um, Mandy Joe, am I correct that we are going to be looking at planning board and ZBA or and finance committee appointments? Those will either be this meeting or the following. The late June meeting, June 26th. The late June meeting. Okay. Are there any other counselor comments? Vince, it's highly irregular for us to allow additional public comment. And in fact, I have to ask the council if they're willing to have it happen because we've already had public comment. Um, is there any objection at this time? Then please come forward, three minutes. Thank you and thank the council. I'm Vincent O'Connor. I live at 175 Summer Street in Amherst. And so, as I see it, the, the town, the city actually faces three main issues. Um, housing costs, which I will address later with a rent control proposal. And the other are roads and educational funding. Um, and I believe that the, the road issue that we should at least try to get a million dollars from the university from two separate funding sources. One would be a, a commuter tax on employees of, of 
business or enterprise that has more than 500 employees um, in the town. And that would apply to the university. Um, and where you would exclude the tax for people make below fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. The second university related funding source would be that for every um, parking permit the university um, issues, which are in the thousands, more than 10, 10 to 15,000, any vehicle that is not garaged, registered in the town of Amherst, the university would keep track electronically because they have the information in order to grant the permit and that they would, um, by negotiation, um, a certain portion of that, either a fixed portion or a percentage would, would go to the town. The first obviously would require an act of the legislature for a commuter tax. The, the other large issue is education funding. And we have a entity in town, the Amherst College, which has is on the low end of, of, of helping out the community in which it is, is located. My view is that the jointly the school committee and the council ought to appoint two to three members to negotiate with Amherst College. Simultaneously, there should be a public organizing efforts completely non-governmentally funded to essentially address the issue to Amherst College. My view is Amherst College should be providing in the order of three quarters of a million to a million dollars, both to Vince, the elementary schools you need to wrap up. and to the secondary schools each Indeed. year. And that should be the negotiating goal of a joint committee of the council and the school committee, um, staffed hopefully by Sean Mangano, who could, who could advise the committee on financial matters and so forth. But unless we do that, we are not going to be able to accomplish the municipal goals that we need to accomplish. And, um, and we've had a budgetary deficit related to Amherst College since the, eight, since the 1980s when Amherst College went, uh, bought out all its fraternities, which I agree with, and, and then took those fraternities off the tax rolls, which, which are all located around the center of town and created an enormous budget hole that has never been filled. Vince, your Thank time you. is up. Thank you. Is there any other public comment from the audience on Zoom? Okay. Are there any other final counselor comments? Seeing none, the meeting is adjourned.